Now let's invite Leslie to give their presentation regarding the Leaders Forum. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Right, so uh, just a bit of a quiz. How many think, or just a guess, actually, how many think, how many people have signed up for next week's forum? I'm taking any numbers. Any starters? How many people have signed up? Put your hands up. Yell out the number. 250. Well, I think you've got a, a word from the Lord. But anyway, anyone? Anyone else? You're close. Maybe insight knowledge. But anyone else? 300. Love your faith. Where else? Probably next year, but we'll get there. One more. 260. You definitely have insight knowledge, definitely. But it's actually 260. All right, but registrations have closed uh, because uh, to, in order to feed the multitudes, we, we have to at least uh, uh, put in uh, lo logistics and the new orders in place. But, uh, so for those of you who have missed out, don't worry about it. There's, uh, some of it, I think it's a Sunday that's open to all uh, like normal, uh, and, uh, and Jan Stewartson will be preaching on Sunday morning. Uh, but for those of you attending now, there's a job to do, which is please attend after you signed up, right? So I know Lord will bless you on a Friday night, which is um, meeting with a number of our mentors. They're all excited to meet those that want to be uh, mentored in their career, whatever stage of their career they're in. And then on Saturday is a morning of teaching in the morning, and in the afternoon there are several breakout sessions, and they're quite fun and hopefully practical for you. So if you're signed up, simple instruction, just turn up and God will bless you. See you then. Good afternoon, church. We are forming a special Christmas choir for our 16th anniversary on December 8th and Christmas service on December 22nd. So if you love to sing, join us in spreading joy through music. The registration is opened until September 30, but hurry because the spot is limited to only 25 people because we'll be singing in the Christmas tree. The rehearsal will start on October 13th forwards. For more information and sign up, scan a QR code on the screen and let me know. Thank you. Hello, sisters, brothers. This is Stella Liu from Women of Faith Ministry. We are very pleased to announce that we will have the CBSI Bible study for the book of Hebrews. And as usual, we will have a Wednesday morning session for the Chinese group, and the Wednesday and Saturday morning session for the English group. Starting from September 1st and September 21st, respectively. As you know, the Hebrews is a very beautiful book, and it's also a book of faith. So we really look forward to read with you, and grow with you, and get connected. So see you later at the booth of Women of Faith. Thank you. Good morning, church. So nice to see all of you come back to, the, uh, to Shanghai and start the new life. So uh, I just want to give the Thanksgiving for our past August Thailand trip. So as you know, we have uh, been announced um, we we're going to have a we went to Thailand last October. And then uh, this is our team photo. Actually, we have 35 people join this mission trip. It's the biggest mission team that I've never lead. So um, by, I, I, w as we share, actually a lot of you guys really pray for this mission. So really wanna see, um, say that uh, we had a very successful mission trip last October. And then by using this chance, I wanna share with you about our upcoming mission trips on September and October. For September trip, we were gonna go to a temple school um, that we're gonna serve um, um, 264 kids there with an uh, English camp to so teach them language learning. And also, uh, we were also going to go to the hospital to teach English to the nurses. And for coming October trip, we are more like, um, you know, um, having this chance to co cooperate with a ch local church and conduct a church camp there. So if you have never joined a mission trip and wanna start your first experience to join a mission trip, please share with me 
or if you want to go to Thailand to serve the local community, also can share with, uh, can let me know. Because as you guys know, uh, actually in Thailand, we have less than 1% of Christian there. So it's a really like a harvest field for, for us to go and um, reach out to them. Thank you. This will be the 14th uh, annual uh, golf charity tournament we are hosting this year. The date of the event is on the 10th, uh, October 18th in Kun San uh, Silport Golf Course. At ICS, we consider ourselves a family blessed to bless the community and the nation. The charity event has so far raised 16 million RMB for the unfortunate one. And our target for this year is 400,000 RMB. And the fund will be distributed to three beneficiaries. The first one is uh, 10 families uh, in Hong Chao community with illness. And we will support them uh, for fees, and including for the, for the kids. And also providing medical escort uh, service and window cleaning service for the elderly uh, in, the, in the community. And the third one will be raising money for uh, Li Chun County, uh, especially for the students uh, who is poor and we will improve their conditions. We are looking for more sponsors this year, uh, especially the economy is not that good. Uh, we hope to raise more fun, uh, money for this, uh, uh, for this uh, unfortunate one, and we need more uh, sponsorship in terms of uh, cash donations. Uh, give and also something for the auctions. Uh, we have a booth outside the hall and uh, we, uh, we'd like you to come forward if uh, you can support us with buying the lottery tickets, uh, not lottery tickets, the lucky draw tickets and also the um, uh, sign up for the events. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Um, our Pre-baptism course, the Get to Life, will happen on November 17th. If you happen to have anybody who uh, around you and uh, have an interest to know Christ and uh, to get baptized with ICS, please encourage them to join us and uh, by scanning the Q by scanning the QR code um, to contact us and uh, know more information. Thank you. Let us prepare our hearts for the Holy Communion. Our dearly Heavenly Father, God of the Trinity, in the Lord's Supper, we remember your eternal love, boundless grace, cross, redemption, and receive assurance of a pardon, adoption, life, and glory. As the outward element nourish our bodies, so may you in dwelling spirit invigorate our souls until that day when we hunger and thirst no more and sit with Jesus at his heavenly feast. Thanks for all the grace and promises for us. Unite with us through the Holy Communion. Makes us above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as the elements pass around you, I would like to ask you to hold the cup and bread until everyone holding it. Then we can join Lord's feast together. I say it is open table, which means if you are Christian, help yourself to take the elements if you are not sure about your faith, hold it, skip it.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, "This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me." Let's take the bread. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is a new covenant in my blood." Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Let's take the cup. Now I would like to pass the time、um, to Leslie. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're well. Um, I, I just, just a word of advice for you.、Um, when you send your pastor a text message, I, I sent him a message last weekend after his sermon, just saying, "Hey, I hope you're well and great message and you know thumbs up stuff." And now, of course, he says, "What you, what are you doing next weekend?" And I realized、uh, he had something urgent on、uh, this weekend, and he asked me to, to share the message with you. The message is entitled "Faith." With works. Last week, if you are not here, and I know there are some visitors with us today, we talked about how Christians behave, right? What, what we wear, what we put on our bodies, what we drink, what we eat, and there are a whole host of other behaviors. Some of it, as he says, is beneficial; it's lawful, but is it really beneficial for ourselves and and for the people around us? I don't know how you felt about that. Um, and、I'm, some of you I know are trying to process that、uh, into the way that you live, but I think it's important that you understand that it's very easy also to fall in legalism. So this morning I woke up and I said, "My pants long enough? If I come in here, will I distract anyone with my shirt color and etc." And I think you can go down that avenue as well, and or you can be full of grace. But as、uh, some of you know, I lead the worship team. But I have an expectation for people that stand up here, though, because they're leaders. So my expectation for the worship team is they will dress appropriately, not distract, both in music and the way they they show up, right?、Uh, and I know that、uh, they know that, and they keep to a very high standard、um, as we lead you in worship as well.、Um, This week has been a tough week for me. I've been traveling almost every week, and last、oh, this week has been a jam-packed week in Singapore. So when Pastor Daniel said share your message, I went yes first, and then regretted it after that. <laughs> and I didn't have any time in the Monday and Friday to to do anything.、It、was eight to eight、uh, meeting people. I'll tell you a little bit because today is about Gen Zs. How many Gen Zs in the room? I can't put my hand up, unfortunately. But yeah, come on, be brave. It's about you today, actually. So come on. How many Gen Zs? Yep, I see some of them there. Yeah, welcome. I had I had a, a dinner with、uh, a couple of employees、uh, in Singapore, and there were Gen Zs at the table, and it was fantastic.、Um, they're all going to get fired, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> they said to me they were all talking about life, you know, and everyone picks up their phone and goes, "Did you see this meme? Did you see the story?" And this this young lady said to me, she said,、uh, "But you do you do know Instagram, right?" Okay, so I said, "Yeah, I do," but you're fired, by the way. And then another conversation came up from a Gen Z, and he was saying, "Oh, this is great story going on on TikTok." But by the way, Leslie, do you know about TikTok? <laughs> so I was、uh, quite、um, upset about that. But it shows age. But I, I think、uh, for the Gen Zs in this crowd, you're not looking for my generation to be friends with you, because you got your own friends. What you're looking for us is to be your role model. To share our lives with you. Now I do realize this message was recorded, but I'm going to share some of my own message with you. And God help me after I say all this about my life. When I was a young man, I was addicted to pornography. Even after I became a Christian, I was really ashamed. So you go into cycles of shame, guilt. Then you get on a high with Christ, and then you go through cycles of shame and guilt again. 
And I'll tell you how I broke free from that. But if you're a non-believer today and you come in here with burdens on your mind, you can't set yourself free. We sung just now that his grace is enough and all you have to do is say, Jesus, I love you. I'm sorry for what I've done. I know you died on the cross for me and you're saved. That's all you need. So I'm going to share a bit about what happens to uh, the story about Gen Z's in a second, but 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. So the first thing your mind will always tell you is, hey, you're doing it tough. No one else is. That's actually rubbish, right? If you look at this, the Bible tells you Jesus knows everything that we're going through. So I'm going to walk through a couple of things. Now, the obsession is what we wear, how we dress, what we look at Christians. And I think the temptation is we go into a lot of legalism, which is not what Christ intended. Take a look at the world around you. I was reading, so I wasn't reading porn last night. Let's just get this straight a little bit. I was reading about porn last night, all right? So you don't want to be mistaken here. And by the way, I'm not a pastor, so I'm going to talk about porn and drinking today, but I'm not a pastor, I'm just simply a volunteer in this church that loves Jesus, right? So, there was a survey done of young people in the United States, and it says they rank not recycling worse than porn, which means they felt that if people were not recycling their plastics, their paper bags, they were more evil than people that watch porn, And you might say, well, really? Well, let's have a look at the text, right? So we're going to dive into Scripture. Uh, Another thing is that, do you have your Bible with you? One of these ones, paperback. You ain't going to fight the enemy without one of these. I know you've got your app and all that. But please, if you want to stand up and stand firm, especially if you're parents of Gen Zs, they don't respect you for who you say you are. They look at you for how you behave. And the only way you behave is this word of God transforms you, right? So I got my boys these books, paper bound, and I got myself because sometimes God speaks to you and you keep underlining that. That reminds you of the fingerprints of God. As a young sister told me that in a Bible, there's a page that is full of dry tears. So every time she flips to that page that your app can't show you, she would say, that's where God met me. So again, if you're a non-believer and your believing friend told you to come to church today, but he ain't carrying one of these, I hope they give you one of these uh, when you say yes to Jesus. So let's jump into it. Matthew 24, 3 to 14. If you see it up there, you want to read it out with me, let's do it. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. To tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Isn't that true? Isn't that true that we believe something on TikTok, but we don't believe something that someone says for the Bible? We go, yeah, that meme was right. That story was right. So quickly, even about weight loss, intermittent fasting, But when someone says, hey, the Bible says that, we go, no, 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 maybe not. So think about this. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, you see this, and kingdom against kingdom, you see that too. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of birth pains. Whoops, and here we go. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. And you can see that's partially happening to Israel right now. And that time that many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. I look at that and I I pray I'm not one of those. But when someone takes me to task about my faith, I go, ugh. Maybe not me. But the Bible says at that time that many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And that many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. 
but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Is this the world we live in today? Yeah. Wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. What shall we do? But the Bible is quite optimistic, I must say. If you look at Isaiah 60, 1 to 3, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. I say again, arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your arising. Arise, shine is a verb. So what are you doing to arise and shine? Because the word's very clear, the light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon this church. But when it gets darker, the church, us, should get brighter, right? So faith in works means that if you have a faith in Jesus, there should be a corresponding difference in the life you make. And I get this empathy, right? Out of COVID, wokeness, everyone says we should empathize. I get this. You know, you empathize with someone, it doesn't mean that you have to believe what they believe. You should stand firm on your beliefs, right? So I get inclusiveness, I get that young people of different shapes and sizes want to get involved. But remember one thing, in the last days, a lot of us in this room, unfortunately, including myself, we will betray Christ because that's what the word says. But the encouragement, he says, is arise, shine. For the light of Jesus has come. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story. I don't know about you guys. Uh, when you travel, uh, what kind of movies you guys watch? Uh, but for me, I, um, as I said, a disclaimer here, I'm not a pastor, so I can, unfortunately, uh, I still have a, a bit of a carnal lifestyle. But I like to look at movies that have shooting, bombing, and killing, right? You know, so for two hours from Hong Kong to Shanghai, I wanted to watch one of those diehard movies, right? Just mindless violence that occupies your mind for two hours, and then you land. So forgive me. So... <laughs> And then I felt the Holy Spirit at that moment. He said to me, don't watch this. Watch the Jesus Revolution. You seen that movie? Now, because it's 18 plus, I'm not going to recommend it to anyone. But if you do want to watch it, it was about this movie that Hollywood made about a pastor called Greg Laurie in the U.S. In the 1960s and 70s, it was a hippie movement where many young people got onto LSD and they were basically drugged out. That's the generation. But it was us watching that show. What this show also showed, probably undocumented or documented, that many thousands of hippies came to Christ. Because the church opened the doors for this, and many thousands came to Christ. And I started to cry. I started to cry because the hippies of today, sorry, the Gen Zs, right? You're the hippies. But the chances are the world has got you hooked on not just drugs, but it's another drug that is on your phone. As I said, I was a young man hooked on pornography. In those days, you had to go to a friend's house. You need to look for a paper magazine, right? You got to hunt for things, but now you don't. Just one thumb press and you are in a world of sin immediately. The lust of the eyes is a lot closer than parents, I think you know this. But what are we doing for this generation of Gen Zs? What are we doing about standing in the gap for them? Right, when the enemy's tactic nowadays is telling the young people that did God say, just like to Eve in the Garden of Eden, that's his strategy. His strategy is confusion, and we as Christians are entertaining thoughts that we should never entertain. So when you say about a renewed mind, it's just like some of us today, we're watching all this stuff on healthy eating. Some of you are not eating any more meat, right? Or some of you are choosing a diet that matches a certain diet plan. Well, it's the same thing with your mind and same thing with my mind. If I keep entertaining and putting into my mind 
any thoughts that come in from the enemy, I'm going to start to live a compromised lifestyle. The devil got me when I was young. And the strategies of the enemy are to target your children right now. They don't target them when they're affluent and rich and got a job. They get them right now. And he then waits. He waits for a time. And like me, where he then fractured my marriage and I almost lost my family. But if I look back at the root cause, it wasn't like, oh, I did something stupid yesterday, life is over. He waits and plays a long game with your children. What are we doing about it as mature believers? Let me just um, maybe read this one. I didn't read it in this morning's sermon, but it's also a warning to us. Mark 8, 14 to 21. The context of this was the disciples had seen the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. They saw two miracles on a mass scale. And this is what they had to say to Jesus, right? I'm sure Jesus was a little bit frustrated. And the disciples had forgotten to bring any food, and they had only one loaf of bread with them in the boat. And as they were crossing the lake, Jesus warned them, Watch out! Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. What do the Pharisees represent? Legalism? Uh, I think, yeah, no, I I shared this message with the youth, so thank you for smiling, but uh, hopefully you remember what I said last time. And of Herod, what does Herod represent? The culture at that time, he was a king, wasn't he? He was quite a mean king as well, but so culture and law, and Jesus said, we wear the yeast. And then that's what the disciples said. They began to argue with each other because they hadn't brought any bread. Isn't that us sometimes? We worry about all this stuff, but Jesus is looking at the heart, right? And then the verse goes on. And they began to argue with each other, and Jesus knew what they were saying, and he said, why are you arguing about having no bread? Don't you know or understand even yet? And this is the, this is the one that, hits me in the heart. Are your hearts too hard to take it in? You have eyes. Can you see? You have ears. Can you hear? Don't you remember anything at all when I fed the 5,000 with 12 loaves, with five loaves of bread? How many baskets were left over? And it goes on. Do you have eyes but you can't see? Do you have ears where you Just don't listen. So here's a sense of urgency about the way we show up, the way we dress, we behave, and perhaps you can extend that to the way we we spend our money, the way we project ourselves. It's not just about tattoos and everything else, although it is. But the big picture here, the devil has got a gun sight in your children, and he is going to steal, kill, and destroy. There's no mercy. I remember a brother said to me when he was recovering from an issue and he said, hey, I'm just going to keep a low profile, Leslie. I'm not going to lead, not going to serve in church and maybe he'll leave me alone. Two months later, where am I? The devil came after his children, nightmares and everything. I said, the devil is no gentleman. And more and more you can see that he's got the next generation in his gun sights, but he doesn't know something. He doesn't know that Jesus is merciful and he has called people like me and this generation to stand up for you, Gen Zs, to stand up for you with everything we've got. And let's talk about this, about having a transformed lifestyle and what did that mean for us? And here it goes again. Let's read James 2, 18 to 24. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. And even the demons tremble, believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Do you see the faith now work, was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God for his accounted to him for righteousness. For he was called the friend of God. 24, you'll see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And I jump to 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. 
Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I've got to read this because if you're a new Christian today, I don't want to uh, confuse you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works least anyone should boast. So if I put it together, it seems to contradict itself, isn't it? But let me just be plain because I think it's very clear from what Pastor Daniel preaches in our church. You don't get to heaven by works. So you get saved purely as a gift from God, this grace that he gives you. And therefore, if you're a Christian or you're a non-Christian today, if there's something in your past that you're ashamed of, he doesn't remember. Your lawless deeds, he remembers no more. But when you're a Christian and you have this faith in you that rises up, you've got to do something with it. Faith then comes with works, right? So I hope that's clear for you. Romans 12, 1, 2, you've read this a thousand times, but I want to focus on one line there that I think will make a difference in your walk. So let's read it together. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he finds, that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. I mean, here's the punchline now, right? Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Very similar to what repentance is, right? When you are a non-believer and you repent and you ask Jesus to come to your life, you're actually changing the way you think, changing the direction of your lifestyle, right? But then as a, as a believer, there's this statement in here that says God transformed into a new person by changing the way you think. And in the English here, in the NLT um, translation, it says, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's a word then there. So it's a very common question for church leaders, right? Hey, uh, how do I know the will of God? Well, there's a then there, isn't it? If you don't have a transformed mind, you're gonna have real difficulties in understanding what is good, pleasing, and perfect. Because your kingdom, if you're still living in a kingdom of darkness, your perception, because remember what the eyes are. In the the physical natural is seeing, but in the spiritual sense, it's about perception. What do you perceive? If you you don't have a renewed mind, you're gonna have to copy the customs of the world, isn't it? But if you have a renewed mind, what you see and your perception changes and therefore your behavior. What you hear, and the Bible talks about it, is understanding. So the situation you understood before you were a carnal Christian will change when you renew your mind because you will understand something quite differently. And I'll share my testimony with you and hopefully to make that point for you. One of these Gen Zs, which I'm about to fire for telling me I don't know about Instagram, um, and we had a chat with her about her career, and she made this statement to me. She said, hey, listen, uh, uh, in the next two years, uh, I can't move. And usually with talent, we like to move them around the world, right, for an international stint. And I said to her, you know, by limiting yourself, by telling me you're not mobile, that you can't travel, because Singapore's a small island, your career options are very limited. And if I can't find you a position by this date, you're out. And then she said, can I tell you the reason why I don't want to move? She said, I'm a Christian and I've committed to God to be a cell group leader in Singapore and she's already Gen Z. So she's looking after the younger generation and she says, God has called me and I'm not moving, Leslie. I'm going to serve God. And of course, she knows I'm a Christian too. And I looked at this and I wonder if she had a renewed mind to trust in God. She didn't really care about whether Leslie could pull it off for her, right? She was trusting God and not necessarily man to assure her of a career and a life. That was one. And then we got talking. I won't tell you which market it was because this market is on my heart. And she says, you know, Leslie, I'll tell you something. When I was young... I was exposed to the culture of this country. I even know how to read and write that language. And a few months ago, she asked for a travel approval to fly to this market, and I was about to say no because 
We don't do that normally for a very junior associate in the company. But God says, say yes. So she went and she was well accepted by the market, but not because of anything else. God had planted something in the life that was preparing her for a role that a stupid person like me would be able to say yes if I simply obeyed God. So I told this Gen Z person, that doesn't forgive you for telling me I don't know about Instagram, but um, you, you have a career not because of me, but because she trusts in God with this renewed mind. Let me just punch out a couple of other verses, um, otherwise Pastor Daniel will have a problem with me, but James 1, 25 to 26 said, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. And those who consider themselves religious, but yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and religion is worthless. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, what you say and sometimes what you don't say. 1 Peter 2, 9-10. to But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you, that's you in this room today, are God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And we talk about light again here, right? And once you were not, and once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So actually, if you're a non-believer today, when you become a believer, you're royalty. So we should act like one, right? You are royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's chosen people. So today we heard about the world in a mess. We talk about an enemy coming after our children. We're not afraid. We are a holy chosen people of God. And if all of us take one step forward to rise up and tell the enemy to get his hands off our children, I think we'll be far better off as we hit into the end times, right? So two things I think we can do is how do we tame our tongue? So as I said about it in verse 26 in James 1, it says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious, but does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. And this one's religion is useless. How many of us have a problem with submitting? I had this conversation with my out my... My younger son is here, but my older son is not, so that's okay, I can speak about him then. Um, <laughs> don't tell Jordan, by the way. Um, so one of the things, I, I had this real fight with him, and you know, teenagers, parents, if you have teenagers, I think you empathize with me, right? I had this real fight with him, and I said to him, there's a problem I have, I don't mind you having a voice about what you want, but if you're rebelling, you're rebelling, it's a problem to me. And the reason is, if you look at the study of Saul, the people wanted a king and God said, okay, right, if you want a king, all right, let it be, let it be Saul. Then what did Saul do? He disobeyed God. And the prophet Samuel got really upset, didn't he, right? So what did the prophet Samuel actually say? He said, hey, listen, Saul, I know you're burning all these sacrifices and everything else, but obedience is better than sacrifice. And then he goes on, if you read that verse, he says, but rebellion is as bad as witchcraft. What does it mean? If you rebel, you're putting yourself into the enemy's camp. So say to young people, I know you're rebelling against your parents because we want you to be X by Y by Z, you know, walk on water, go to Harvard, whatever it is. We all want that. I'm an Asian parent. It's in my DNA for some reason. I want you to perform Excel, you know, play violin, do three things at one time, use your legs, all the rest of it. No wonder you rebel. But rebellion is as bad as witchcraft. So don't rebel. Find a way to check. And I think as, I, as a parent now, so I'm, I'm doing this real time, by the way. So I have no credibility to say I've done it all before and I've, I'm wise and my hair is all white so I can tell you the meaning to life. I don't. 
I go through this struggle every day for my sons, but my verbatim and what I've said as a renewed mind has changed. I hope my sons love Jesus. Just the other day, I told my son, I said, hey, listen, you're at university now, you're independent, but there's one thing I want you to be dependent on, is God. I had this bad fight with him a few years ago. It's always my oldest son. My youngest is perfect, right? Right, wherever. <laughs> Sorry, don't tell him. I'll be in trouble. Don't tell my oldest son. I had this real big fight with him when he was in high school. We were shouting. I mean, it was really bad. And, and he says, I don't, I don't, he said something else, but I won't repeat it. But he just said, I don't care about your Bible. I just really don't care about your, 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 your going to church and all that. I don't care. And I just remember saying, but I'm sorry. I don't have anything else to give you. I, I just know Jesus. That's all I have. That's me. So if you ask me what I talk about most days, I talk about Jesus. I talk about his love for me. I talk about how I screwed up and how he still loves me. But all we have is Jesus. That's all I have. And I think he stopped yelling at me by then, which is, praise God. But your tongue, if you're not willing to submit, there's a real problem here. And actually, submission is a kingdom strategy. If you haven't realized it in your walk, note to the young people here, the last will be first. Let's read it together. Matthew 19.20, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. If you haven't realized it, the kingdom of God is an upside-down world. If you think that God has forgotten you, he's got something bigger planned for you. If you think your marriage is about to fracture and you've left it and abandoned it, boy, has he got plans for you, but he's looking for you to submit. Right, I know women, you've got a problem with submitting to your husband sometimes, but you know, submit to God first, well, then it will take care of itself. But by the way, I do submit to my wife when I'm at home. She's the boss. But when it comes to spiritual matters, I've got to stand up. Not because I want to, but God tells me to. God tells me to pray for my family. So sometimes I sort of overstep myself and say, God told you to do that. Of course, I get in trouble after that. But I think it's important that we recognize in 1 Peter 5, it says, God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. So it then says that if you humble yourself under God's mighty hand, that he, he will exalt you in due time. So if you're wondering in your business, in your leadership, you want a promotion, but you're stuck, or your kid doesn't get into a high school team as the captain or whatever it might be, don't blame the devil. Because if you're proud, God, by the word here, will oppose you. So you don't kill yourself, you don't mess up and hurt others. So if you're looking for what God has wanted you to know, submission is a strategy. God puts kings and queens in place. Read Daniel. He puts kings and queens in place, but he takes them out of place as well. Let me just tell you a story, and we'll move on to the second piece here. I was a, a very arrogant young man, too. About, apart from being in porn, drinking heavily, what else you have? Arrogant. So God chose to give me a more arrogant boss one year, and he stripped me of my title and told me to leave a position that I loved so much. You see what God does to humble somebody? He puts somebody else more arrogant than you to show you, my goodness, what an arrogant person. And then he goes, how about you? How about you? I'm thankful for that because I'm a lot happier now. But as I look back, I just thank God that I wasn't humiliated. I was humbled under his mighty hand. And then he would exalt me in due time. 1 Peter 5 was a verse I hung on to for many, many years. And 1 Corinthians 1, 27, but God chooses the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Just a word, for those of you who are not serving, you should serve in church. You should. Why? Oh boy. When I came to here to serve, I started ushering 
It was my first job in the church because I had backslidden so far that I think no one would trust me if I stood up here. But I realized that I had to humble myself when people get upset with me for asking for their passports. Right? Not everyone's good, by the way, in the morning, especially with the grumpy on Sundays. That made me somebody didn't come on time and I needed to fill the gaps in. Things like that happen. But God uses the time where you serve someone else in church to humble you. The more you're humble, the more you'll be in position for a greater season of blessing. Because when the blessing comes, it could be financially, positionally, status-wise, he knows your head will not explode. That you'll be ready for a journey of influence, that you'll be ready to stand up for a generation that needs us so badly right now. The second aspect I wanted to read, and then we'll close today, because I want to spend some time with you to respond to the message. John 5, 5 to 9. One man that had been invalid for 30 years, Eight years. That's a long time. When Jesus saw him lying there and realized that he had spent a long time in this condition, he asked him, and this is quite an interesting statement, do you want to get well? I read this over and over again. I wonder why Jesus didn't go, boom, boom, healed. Why do you have to ask this? <laughs> do you want to be healed? I mean, of course, the answer is, oh, Yes. Do you want to be healed? It's a question for those of you who are suffering under bondage and addiction now. What did the invalid say? He says, Sir, the invalid replied, I have nobody to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm on my way, someone else goes in before me. And then Jesus said, told him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. And immediately the man was made well, and he picked up his mat and began to walk. It's quite interesting if you read this. This guy was witnessing people getting healed every day, especially when the angels stirred the waters in this pool in Bethesda. He was seeing people healed every day with his own eyes. But yet he felt, hmm, it wasn't for me. I've got some excuses, people ahead of me and all that. Uh, I mean, some, some people even sort of, I mean, it's a bit of tongue-in-cheek here, a bit of humor. He could have rolled himself in, right? Um, but I won't go there. It's not written in Scripture. But I would simply say as today, if you're living in addiction, is God saying, do you want to be healed? And there's a statement by a Christian counseling coalition about addictions. They best describe addiction as voluntary slavery. The reason why they say that, now not to, um, and please I respect for those who are suffering from depression, it's not that easy. But the value of this terminology is that it both recognizes the individual's responsibility and the involuntary nature of a habit. That while you have a habit that's difficult to break, you have a responsibility. So if you're addicted to porn, if Jack Daniels is your best friend, I think Jack Daniels probably gone out of fat with the young people, and you think, I can only have release I can only de-stress if I'm having B-52s and having six shots and then throwing up like I did, being plastered dry. And I tell you all the stories I've had with, I don't even know how I got home. Do you want to be healed? It can stop today, but it starts with you first saying, Jesus, I want to be healed. So I wonder if you could... Get the worship team up. Um, if they're not in the room, ah, there's Elvina, thank you. Just close your eyes. Um, Jeremiah 29, 11, and I'll close with that. God has plans for you, and you know, his word says that, you know, imagine if you speak to God today, if you look at Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I've got plans for you. I got plans for you. I have good thoughts towards you to prosper you. And if you were to humble yourselves before me, I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. That you will be my people. 
as you bow your heads now and close your eyes, this out of respect for those who want to put their hands up, I'm going to call you to respond today. I'm going to perhaps try and identify with the younger generation. Do you want to just be a level zero Christian? Right? We're just murmuring around, what can I wear? What can I look at? And all these very basic things in life. They're important, no doubt. But there's a bigger picture in mind. Why don't you level up? Right, time to get back to scripture, time to dig hard into his word, time to meditate on his word. If you don't have time, then make time. Get up early. Don't be lazy. Get up early at 6:30 and says, God, I would worship you. I'll read your scriptures. I'll take my Bible study seriously. I won't be religious about it, but I want to know you more. If you're an investor in finances, you know this well. Why not you say to God, show me a slice of heaven that I'll invest more and more and more of my time into the things of the kingdom. So first question, and I mean to get you to respond, if you're steep in addiction and you're fitting that, 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 that profile today of someone that says, and Jesus is reaching out to you and saying, do you want to be healed? If that's you, would you raise your hand? No one's seeing, only God can see. I'd just like to pray for you. If you're stuck at the moment and you feel that, God, sister, I see your hand, praise God. If you say, do you want to be healed, brother? I see your hand. He'll heal you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, brother. I see your hand as well. Father, I stand in the gap for my brothers and sisters who are struggling. And you're asking them the question today, do I want to be healed? And we say yes. We say yes, Lord. I want to live a life transformed. Thank you very much for responding. The second group of people I want to challenge you is that you're worried about your children. And some of you have children that you've lost. They're not coming to church anymore. And you're thinking, where are they? Where are the prodigals that you want your son or your daughter to come home? That you don't know if they go to the bars at night. You don't know what they're up to. And you're praying for God for mercy. I want to stand with you today. If you're worried and you have a prodigal son and daughter that you worry about, just raise your hands. I want to stand with you. Sister, I see you. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray as a church that people in my age group, Sister, I see your hand, will stand up with you to claim back a generation that the devil is trying to steal. In the name of Jesus, we pray that the gates of hell will not prevail. And Father, we pray as a church that we will take our families back. We claim them for you. Last but not least, I, I think there's some non-Christians in the crowd today and uh, no shame. If today is your moment, then God had planned this moment in his mind for a very long time. If you're not a believer and you don't know who Jesus Christ is, you don't have a personal relationship with him, but you want to say yes today. If that's you, I'm giving you an opportunity in the next minute or so just to raise your hands that I can lead you in a prayer of salvation. If that's you, would you raise your hand, please? Yes, I see your hand, sister. I see your hand. anyone else why don't we all say this prayer with uh, our sister why don't we do that in unity right Lord Jesus who is screwed up haven't we and Father we live with the shame of everything we've said and done but Father I know that you're a God who's genuine who loves us regardless of all our sins Father and so, Father, we acknowledge we're a sinner. We're screwed up. Father, I know that you've died on the cross for us. And the blood of Jesus is final. The Bible tells us that the sins and lawless deeds you will remember no more. So, sister, if you say this with me, that I ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life, that I invite him, him to be Lord. Jesus, we said, Amen. 
and sister, welcome to the kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So if you, for the individual that gave your life to Christ, if you make yourself known to a member of our staff or the volunteers, they would love to just pray with you outside and give you a Bible as well, yeah? Um, just before I dismiss you, can I pray for you and then we'll let you go for the day. Father God, we just thank you for this time, Father. Your presence has been here today, Father. Father, we stand united to be a church that has faith but works as well. We, faith, we pray, Father God, that w e l l help us rise, shine. We pray for the, the generation that revival will come through this next generation of 19 and 35 years old. Show us a people of my age what we can do to sometimes get out their way. Nurture them, support them, and pray for them. Father, we finally pray for our sisters and brothers who are in addiction, Father. There's no shame in that. And Jesus died for us all. We pray, Father, that today their yes will be a yes, Father. And as you change the way they think, they will go forth, Father God, to step up in faith. So I pray for all the families, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you be present in their lives and their coming and going. For those that travel on business, we pray for their safety and their mercy. We pray for our spouses that are at home, Father, that you fill their days with joy, even as they take care of our children while we are away. In the name of Jesus, everyone said, Amen. Thank you very much. Well, I hope you enjoyed the service today, and thank you so much for joining us. And I know that you've been encouraged by the preaching of the word, that you know that God loves you and He has good thoughts toward you. You can continue to follow us on our website uh, and our social media accounts a n d YouTube, Facebook, you can Instagram, or simply drop us an email to keep in touch. And here at ICS, we're a church, we're a family that's blessed to bless the community and the nations. So we hope that you were blessed today and you're really trying to think about how you can be a blessing uh, to your neighbors and those around you. Well, we hope you have a great Sunday ahead and we look forward to seeing you real soon. God bless. <laughs>